of National Space Program. It is indeed our pleasure that former Director Space Application Center, Dr. R. R. Navalgund, is here with us to share his vast knowledge and experience. We welcome you, sir. We have among us, amongst us, our own Dr. S. P. Agrawal, Director Not. Uh, Northeastern Space Application Center and President ISRS to grace this occasion. We welcome you, sir. So uh, I request all the dignitaries to kindly grace the dais and I request Director IRS Dr. R.P. Singh to kindly accompany the dignitaries to the dais. Sir, please. Thank you, sir. Dr. R. R. Navalgun, after joining his doctorate degree in physics from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Bombay, joined the Space Application Center of the Indian Space Research Organization at Ahmedabad in 1977. He served ISRO in different capacity for the last 40 years. His major scientific contributions are in the broad area of Earth observation systems, science and applications. He was responsible for the formulation and execution of many national level application programs. These include use of earth observation data in natural resource survey related to agriculture, forest, groundwater, snow and glaciers, coastal seas, ocean, etc. An important establishment of the several remote sensing applications and centers in different states of the country and establishment of the natural national natural management system and then rms as a dead application center scientific leadership and supervision for the development of electro optical and microwave sensors flown on earth observation and planetary science missions and communication and navigation payloads flown on the onboard Indian satellites and development of associated ground segments. He was instrumental in the establishment of the decision support center for the disaster monitoring at NRSC. He represented ISRO India at many multilateral international forums such as UN Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, Group on Earth Observation, Committee on Earth Observation Systems and has inferred with several space agencies of major space faring nation, including US, France, China, and many other in the leadership role. He served as a visiting professor at IIT Mumbai 2015 to 17. He was the president of the International Society for Photogrammetry and National Remote Sensing Technical Commission 7th 2000 to 2004. He is an academician of the International Academy of Astronautics, a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences and an honorary fellow of the Indian Society of Remote Sensing. He is the recipient of M.M. Chaugani Memorial Award of the Indian Physics Association in 2020, Aryabhatta Award of the Astronautical Society of India in 2012, Outstanding Achievement Award of ISRO, Bhaskara Award of the Indian Society of Remote Sensing, Maharana Uday Singh Award for Environment in 2009, instituted by the Maharan, Maharana of Mewar Foundation, Udaipur, Technical Excellence Award of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Bombay, besides many other. We are truly honored by your presence, sir. Now I request Director Iris to kindly welcome Dr. R. R. Navalgund with a plan. Now I request uh, Dr. S. P. Agrawal to welcome Dr. Navalgun from ISRS. Sir. Thank you, sir. We have amongst us Dr. S. P. Agrawal. He is uh, the former scientist of uh, 
IARS and he joined IRS in 1996 and worked for almost 25 years over here at IARS. After that, he assumed the charge of director and ISAC with effect from uh, September 17th, September 2021. He has taken important initiative towards the effective utilization of space science and technology for various developmental activities in northeastern regions, such as natural resource management, weather forecasting, satellite communication application, ICT based and geo governments related application, etc. Prior to joining NISAC, he served as the group head of the Water Resources Department of IRS where he successfully led several regional and national projects covering large-scale hydrological modeling, irrigation water management, soil erosion assessment, snow, ice, and glacier melt studies, flood mapping, monitoring, cryospheric research in Antarctica and Arctic region, etc. He demonstrated, uh, demonstrated exemplary leadership in the uh, simultaneous progress of the group in research applications and capacity building. He received several awards and honors, including the Eminent Engineer Engineers Award for 2024 conferred by Institution of Engineering in India, Uttarakhand State. He received the President Appli Appreciation Medal for 2016 from the Indian Society of Remote Sensing and prestigious National Geospatial Award for the Excellence in 2018 conferred by ISRS. He received very prestigious national award for e-governance in 2022 silver medal for the excellence in adopting emerging technologies conferred by the Department of Administrative Reforms and Public Grievances, Government of India. He is a fellow of the Institution of Engineers and Indian Society of Remote Sensing and Indian Association of the Hydrologist. Sir, we are truly honored by your presence. Now I request Director IRS to kindly welcome Dr. S.P. Agrawal. Thank you, sir. Now I request Director Iris, Dr. R.P. Singh, to kindly address the gathering. Good morning to all of you. Respected Dr. Noel Boon, Dr. S.P. Agrawal, dignitaries, guests, faculty members, students, and IRS members, particularly those who are seeing this online. Welcome to the National Remote Sensing Day function at IRS Dehradun. My greetings to all of you. We celebrate this, this particular day in the honor of Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, who is the father of space research in India. By the start of space era in 1957, India quickly uh, established many experiments and uh, institution in country. And uh, we were quick to adopt this technology uh, in this six, era of 60s. In this particular sequences, I Dehradun was one of its initiative of India, which was established in 1966, which gave the impetus to the remote sensing developments in country. We remember today Dr. Sarabhai and his vision that in that era of 60s, he thought of a vision of six decades, seven decades, which actually happened on the ground. And so, and today we are seeing the fruit of this, uh, his vision that most of his, uh, what he thought of the, um, do, during those days has uh, successfully implemented on ground. And what we are seeing today that this technology is going further and further. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Dr. Noel Gund as chief guest who has witnessed this particular successful journey of remote sensing from 70s onwards starting from a spectral signature, when the signature itself was not known in our country, he used to conduct experiment in this, uh, uh, the SAC uh, uh, campus and nearby places, uh, laboratories. And uh, he has conceptualized during that time how this remote sensing will go further, because at that time there was no as such uh, infrastructure, and nothing was very much concrete. And an enormous concept is one of them. As one of the primary member who established that concept, all the state remote sensing centers in the country came up because of that concept. And we are we all know that the strength of the anonymous, which made this uh, the remote sensing now I mean uh, amenable or uh, reachable to everybody from universities to uh, state government and everything. 
He led many national programs, as Dr. Richa was telling, including heading the institution, formulating the plan. In fact, the, what we see today in IS is one of his, I mean, his visionary ideas during 2000, when a lot of new development took place in pharma projects, research scholars, and change in the ecosystem of research. Today is a special day to me, personally, because I joined with him uh, in his team in Space Application Center, the agricultural team, and later on I got opportunity to also work as a student with him in his supervision. So it's to me, sharing a dance with him is a great, uh, uh, I would say, achievement for, for any student or any person would like to have in his career. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, uh, sir, for accepting our invitation to come and grace this particular function. I'm also thankful to Dr. S.P. Agrawal, uh, who kindly agreed and uh, has come to IRS today. My best wishes to the, the, this uh, particular National Remote Sensing Day program, and I hope uh, we are going to have a fruitful discussion onwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I request uh, Dr. M. P. S. Bish to kindly present the floral bouquet to Director IIRS from ISRS site. Uh, Dr. Bish is currently uh, chairperson ISRS Dehradun chapter. Uh, I request uh, Dr. Praveen to kindly present a floral uh, bouquet to Dr. Aspi Agrawal from ISRSI. Thank you, sirs. Now I request uh, Director Eniset, Dr. Aspi Agrawal, to kindly address the gathering. <laughs> Thank you, Madam. Very good morning to each and everyone present here. The most respected chief guest of the function and our guest speaker on the National Remote Sensing Day 2024, Dr. R. Nawalgum, sir. Dr. Uh, Raghavan Pratap Singh Ji, Director of Indian Institute of uh, Remote Sensing. There is more importantly, the senior ISRH also about this who is the chair of this. Uh, all the ISRS member who are listening is uh, li listening us across the country. Dear students from CSTAP, dear students from various courses of IRS, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, it is my proud privilege to stand before you as a president of Indian Society of Remote Sensing. In fact, I'm very happy to tell you that to the society, I was introduced by the none other than the chief guest of today's uh, function, Dr. R. Navalgun. Thank you very much, sir, for introducing me to the society. I remember you, are the, you told me that why don't you join the society as a secretary of ISRS, then I become the secretary of ISRS long back in 2012. Friends, we are uh, celebrating this uh, National Remote Sensing Day by paying homage to our great visionary, great leader, great, great uh, uh, what do you call, institution builder, Sri, uh, and of course, father of our space program, Dr. Bikram Sarabhai. At the very young age, he established the first institute, which is known as Physical Research Laboratory at Ahmedabad. You can imagine 1948. He was born in 1919, 12th August, and that's why we are celebrating this remote sensing day by remembering him. Uh, but then, any institutions you may be aware, of course, he was the chair of atomic energy, he was the chair of space committee, sorry, this uh, uh, Coast Power Committee, as well as the uh, chair of uh, ISRO. Uh, he did, uh, uh, in fact, when we people were thinking because we got independence in 1947, and people were really worried about the hunger of the people, fighting for the hunger of the people. That time he thought there is only one option you have, and that is a science and technology. And if we use the science and technology properly, we can really take out all our people from starvation. And that was his vision. That was his 
ideas. Then he thought, why not it is a space technology, which is very, very important, which provide a lot of information. When there was a discussion between, or this fight between uh, USSR and East Valley USSR and USA about the space, who will go first to the moon and all these things. But that time in 16, beginning of the 60s or end of the 50s, he thought we should have our own space program. And that is the reason in 1962, the first committee on space program and research was constituted. And then in 1969, we had our own Indian Space Research Organization. And in 1972, Department of Space was established, under which all our institutions came, like NISA Hyderabad, Institute of Remote Sensing, that time part of, it became a part of uh, uh, that NRSA Hyderabad. So there's a history. In fact, if I come to the Indian Society of Remote Sensing, it was established in 1969 with a humble beginning of only 56 members. And now we have 6,300 plus members all across the country. In fact, our members are not only living in our country, they are working all across the globe. They are the member of, they are the scientists in NASA, they may be the scientists in JAXA, they may be scientists in ESA, all our members are working. So Indian Society of Remote Sensing become a very, very uh, important society. Few days back, I was there in uh, Philippines attending a ISPS uh, midterm symposium and I met with the president, Dr. Lina and uh, Christian Hipke, former president. And really he was telling me that how ISRS doing well in our country and how much ISPRS is benefited from uh, that ISRS. I would like to highlight here, the basic objective of Indian Society of Remote Sensing is advancement and dissemination of the remote sensing technology for the benefit of the people, natural resource management, disaster risk management, et cetera, et cetera. And there is a, in 1973, first time our journal started actually, that time it was known as photo nirvachan. Then it became a new, uh, the Journal of Indian Society of Remote Sensing. Now it is published every month. Already, Dr. Richa has uh, introduced our honorable guest, a chief guest. Dr. Uh, R.P. Singh Saab also introduced our chief guest. But if I will not tell a small thing about uh, a small small thing about our chief guest, it will be you know it will not be justified. If you look at his entire you know journey. A young boy started from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. That time, it was more than IIT. I can tell you all young boys and girls. It was more than IIT. When you are you are working with TIFR, means to, if you are a student of TIFR, he started a humble journey from that. Joined Indian Space Program. Whatever you are seeing today, Indian Space Program, somewhere he has put his hand in that. Whether it was the beginning of understanding the remote sensing, how the remote sensing data can be utilized, what kind of sensor we should have. You must have heard about the LIST-3, LIST-4, resource set 1, resource set 2. It is Dr. Naval one. It was his, you know, uh, what you call vision. Resource set 1 and resource set 2 material, his vision only. His contribution is immense, I can tell you. In fact, he is mentor of many leaders in this field at this moment. I don't want to name those leaders, but you know them very well. And he's the mentor of them. You can imagine his contribution to this. He taught us how to utilize the space data for the application, for natural resource management, for disaster risk management. But then there was a question, whether this society or this remote sensing should be limited to confined to our administrative boundary of India. Then it was thought, no. We should contribute to the other societies. And then we started working on International Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. And he was the president, if I'm not wrong, sir, 2004 to 2008 in Technical Commission 5, uh, 7. He was the president. In fact, uh, that uh, 2000 to 2004, Dr. George Joseph was the president. Then he became the president. And really, our ISRS is particular, uh, it is spread being all across the world. When you become a technical commission uh, president, basically you have various working group all across the globe. So that time the leadership of ISRS, you know, that shows their strength. And that's how our honorable chief guest has created awareness among the entire globe that how remote sensing society can help the common people. And also, I, you may not be aware that 
whatever change over happened new constitution he was the main you know architect of the new constitution of indian society of remote sensing many changes he brought in the indian society of remote sensing so it came out now uh, uh, very well and doing very well nalgun also contributed in various forum already dr richa has told it is not only limited to isprs it is not only limited to the aars it is like geos co many 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 all across the world. so it is our, it is our honor that we should we have a such a great personality here a brilliant scientist a great administrator a visionary leader we have today sir it is indeed our honor and privilege that you accepted our invitation and you are going to deliver a talk on remote sensing genesis evaluation and the role of professional society so on behalf of indian society of remote sensing sir i welcome you and thank you very much thank you thank you sir now i request dr r r navalgun sir to kindly address the gathering with his vast knowledge and experience sir please This is okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. good morning to everybody uh, i must uh, thank uh, for very kind introduction uh, perhaps uh, a little bit overblown uh, because i don't think i deserve all that accolades dr s p agrawal president of the indian society of remote sensing as well as the director of the northeastern space application center dr raghavendra pratap singh director of the indian institute of remote sensing praveen thakur secretary of the indian society of remote sensing professor bist sahab all fellow staff members of the iirs many young colleagues of iirs as well as isrs members of the isrs and all those who have been perhaps online uh, to listen to this talk uh, it's my great pleasure to address this gathering on national remote sensing day when i was today morning listening to uh, some brief presentations uh, from two of my uh, colleagues from iirs i was uh, actually looked at the content and the advances that they are doing and i was uh, thinking myself i am nowhere because whatever knowledge that i have is fossilized it's very old so what do i say about this so i was a bit uh, apprehensive about that thing in fact when first professor agarwal spoke to me i told him look i i'm now not in the pictures so please don't ask me to give any talks or any such thing but then he said no you can still speak on certain things so i decided to speak on things which you may not know of the past because that is the only way i can make myself heard 
rather than talking about the advances that are taking place today in the area of remote sensing. Now, National Remote Sensing Day, as you have seen, is celebrated on the birthday anniversary of Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. Dr. Vikram Sarabhai was born on August 12, 1919 in Ahmedabad in a very rich aristocratic family, business family. He had his early education in Ahmedabad. He had some education also in Bombay Institute of Science, Royal Institute of Science, it is called, it is opposite to Cooper Ridge Football Stadium, where present Sachivalaya is also there. And then he went to Cambridge uh, on the recommendation of none other than Professor or Nobel Laureate Ravindranath Tagore. Ravindranath Tagore was a family friend of Sarabhai's, and he wrote a letter of recommendation recommending Vikram Sarabhai to the University of Cambridge. So he went there to do his um, PhD in physics. But unfortunately, it was the time of the Second World War. So he had to come back to India. He came back along with Dr. Homi J. Bhabha. Homi J. Bhabha, of course, had completed his PhD. Both went to Bangalore, Indian Institute of Science, under C. V. Raman. And they spent some time there trying to do research. Both were very aristocratic families, as you know, and uh, as it uh, as it is said, both of them stayed in Taj West End Hotel in Bangalore, and that is a very very expensive hotel, and that is where they stayed, both of them. Vikram Sarabhai also met Manalini Sarabhai, not Sarabhai, Manalini something else. Uh, no, she was a dance. Uh, she was. A, a Bharatanatyam dance, uh, and uh, she was giving some performances in Bangalore. She was the daughter of a, you know, ICS. In the British system, there was ICS, Indian Civil Service, they used to call it. So she was the daughter of an ICS, and he fell in love, he married. And then as the uh, Second World War uh, was uh, concluded, he went back to Cambridge, and uh, we completed his PhD, Vikram Sarabhai, and came back to Ahmedabad in 45 or so. Then he found that Homi Bhava had set up Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bombay in 1945. So Vikram Sarabhai did not want to lag behind. He set up Physical Research Laboratory in 1948 and started work on cosmic rays, etc. Of course, Vikram Sarabhai also started uh, one is called Patira, which is Ahmedabad Textile Industry Research Association. Because in textile research, there was a lot of research which needed to be done in order to improve the quality of the fabric so that it can be, he established that kind of a research laboratory, which is just opposite to the physical research laboratory campus. He also established a little later Indian Institute of Management on the bath. And in the mean, around 60s, he also started working on the Thumba Equatorial uh, Launching Station, Rocket Launching Station, ASKS was called. He also started what is called as RSMD, that is Remote Sensing and Meteorology Division in Ahmedabad, in that place, uh, that is today's SAC campus. And by then, uh, another great gentleman, Professor Pishiroti, had retired from the Indian Meteorological Department. In fact, he was the director of the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology in Pune, he joined PRL as an emeritus honorary professor. So he gave him the responsibility of remote sensing and meteorology, a small unit in 
that came first. And there was also Ahmedabad experimental earth station. And that was for training people from other countries in doing satellite communication. All this Vikram Sarabhai was doing. Now, during this time, in 1966, very unfortunately, Professor Homi Bhabha passed away in an air crash. And now the responsibility, most of it, fell on Vikram Sarabhai. So Vikram Sarabhai was the secretary general or second vice president, they used to call it, of an organization called Committee on, uh, Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, COPUAS. And these meetings used to be held in Vienna in 68-69, around that period. And at that time, United States was already engaged in preparing for their first Earth Resources Technology Satellite, ERTS-1. It was later launched, as you remember, in 1972. And there was a lot of presentations in that particular seminar on what U.S. scientists were doing with the simulated Landsat data. And that made Vikram Saravai start thinking that if we could do similar things, we will be leapfrogging into the technology. We don't have to wait and keep following others. But we, if we start doing these things at the same time, then we will be leapfrogging into technology. So he came back to India and told Professor Pisharoti, you start doing these things, you initiate these experiments of how to use this data for our own natural resources survey, etc. So at that time, there was a problem in Kerala. The coconut trees, which were there, they had a disease, root wilt disease, it is called. That essentially means the canopy of the coconut trees would have lose their pigments and get diseased. And thereby, they are also contagious. So that the entire coconut plantations would suffer. So in fact, the government at that time was trying to give 500 rupees to each farmer to remove his coconut tree, which is affected by this root wheel disease. The farmer said, we don't know which one is affected because it is on the top, on the head canopy. So Pisharuti and Professor Dakshina Murthy from the Inaflos means those which are a green tarpaulins or green plants. Green tarpaulins are only emitting green, whereas green vegetation also was emitting or reflecting in near infrared. So there's the distinction which these color infrared films could make. And these were invented during the Second World War. So they used these, which were provided by the US, 1,000 feet height. And then they used the Hasselblad cameras, which were provided by the Germans. The scientists were Indians, and so also the nuts, the coconuts. And this experiment, in fact, that the image that you see here on this is the image from that 1970 experiment. Now, whether you can make out which trees are affected by root wheel disease, I do not know. But you can, and uh, I did see them under the, uh, the you know, enlargers, et cetera. You will be able to see that those, some of the trees which have a less pigmentation in red, I mean, you can make out that they are the diseased ones. So this is how the beginning of the genesis of the remote sensing started as far as color infrared, use of color infrared films are concerned. But I must say that this place, the Indian Institute of Remote Sensing, is the original place where the aerial remote sensing started. Because the visit of the Prime Minister Nehru to the then uh, Netherlands, and he had a meeting with the president of the Netherlands, who himself was a surveyor. And when they had discussions, the president of Netherlands said that I will assist India 
in establishing a training institute for interpreting aerial images in surveying. Okay, so that was the idea with which the, the so-called photo into surveying training institute, later on called photo interpretation institute, later on called Indian Institute of Remote Sensing. That is how it started. So in a way, IIRS is also one of the uh, initial centers from where the remote sensing has originated. So at that time, after all these things, unfortunately, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai also passed away in 1971. So once he passed away, at that time, Professor Dhawan became the chairman. Once Professor Dhawan became a chairman, being an engineer and not a visionary scientist in this sense, he had a different way. He wanted to put a systems approach to the entire gamut of space activities in the country. So he said that the small, small units like RSMD, SKS, and other things are not good for, uh, the, for this uh, Ahmedabad center. So he combined all those things and requested Professor Eshpal to come there as the founder director. Now, Professor Eshpal, who became the founder director of the Space Application Center, he said that I need a certain level set of people who have the expertise in different things. What are those different things? I want people who can build instruments which can go into space. I require people who can do the data analysis, computer simulation, image processing, etc. I require people who can do the interpretation and analysis. So he got his three colleagues from TIFR. One was Sri D.S. Kramat, Dr. John Joseph, and Dr. Baldev Sahai. Dr. Hari Haran was already there in the Space Application Center. So George Joseph started building instruments. Kamath started looking at computer image processing. Baldev Sahai got into the issues of uh, interpretation of the aerial images, etc. And this is only related to remote sensing. There was the other part related to satellite communication as well. So the, Dr. Hamilton, being more influenced by Professor Pisharuti, he started building a thermal scanner because he was interested in measuring the sea surface temperature because that's very important for the monsoon studies. So the genesis of this particular remote sensing activities, I have told you about how it is in IIRS or Photo Interpretation Institute and how it started at the Space Application Center. And these people started building these things, etc. First, they built some aerial instruments, then they went on to build space instruments, etc. Now, in the meantime, there was also a cooperation between, between India and the USSR. And the Soviet Union, at that time, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Brezhnev, who was the president of the USSR, he promised that I will give you a launch facility if you build satellites. That is how the initial Bhaskara 1 and 2 satellites India could build in order to send them through the Baikonur Cosmodrome through the Russian uh, launch vehicles. Or actually, they are not Russian. Uh, they are the present uh, one other country which was part of the Soviet Union. So that's how it started. This is the genesis of those uh, things. But there's another side, very important, uh, not story, actual factually what happened. In the process of combining these things on the campus of the Space Application Center, there was one gentleman called Wing Commander K.R. Rao. Now this Wing Commander K.R. Rao was actually looking after the experimental Earth station. And uh, this Wing Commander Rao was not made the director of the Space Application Center. It was Professor Eshpal who had made the Space Application So Wing Commander Rao was sent to ISRO headquarters in 1971, 72 or so around that time. He wasn't very happy with that. So he left. He left ISRO, 
he had a good friend in uh, a person called Dr. Arkot Ramachandran, who was the secretary in the Department of Science and Technology in Delhi. During this time, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, who was the prime minister of this country, went to US and met Ronald Reagan. Now, Reagan, who was the president then, in one of the discussions that they had, he said, we have just now launched ERTS-1, or called Landsat, and we want the data of this satellite, which is the Earth Observation Satellite, to be received in India. We will help you to build an Earth station for this. And uh, this was a very good opportunity. So Department of Science and Technology, Government of India said, yes, we will take it up. And they knew that Wing Commander Rao had all the experience of the Earth Station related things. So they said, no, we should set up an institute. We should set up an agency. That is how the National Remote Sensing Agency was set up at Hyderabad. Wing Commander Rao was made the director of this uh, agency, it was called. And he approached the Andhra Pradesh government. He got 323 acres of land in Shadnagar and went to Shadnagar to build the earth station for receiving data from the Landsat. And you can see in this picture, Professor Dhan, of course, you can see. And the person who is a little bald is Dr. Ernie's wing commander, K.R. Rao. He is the original founder director of NRSA. This is all very important to know that this is how, because of the differences, because of the personalities at three places, Indian Institute of Remote Sensing, Space Application Center, as well as at the National Remote Sensing Agency, more or less at the same time, remote sensing in different ways grew or its genesis. Now, NRC was not part of ISRO. NRC was part of TST. This institute was part of Survey, Survey of India. But then, this was brought under NRC. So it came from being a government to an autonomous. Then, of course, it had again become a government. That's a different matter. But these were the things that the, the genesis of the uh, the way remote sensing has grown in these three places uh, in the beginning. So the Professor Eshpal and his team of those uh, Kamath, George Joseph, and uh, Balde Sahai, Hari Haran, and Wing Commander Rao. Soon Wing Commander Rao brought Professor Dikshitlu because Professor Dikshitlu had worked with Professor Dhawan in the Aerospace Laboratories, Aerospace Department of Indian Institute of Science. And he had done extensive work on this image processing, etc. He was an electrical communication engineer. So he was also brought from there. Uh, Bhavan, Bhavan advised that uh, Professor Dikshitlu can go and assist Wing Commander Rao, because Wing Commander Rao was basically an engineer who was looking at the Earth Station development. Now, soon, Dr. Uh, Professor Dhavan realized that what is the use of all this remote sensing? Unless this data is used, and he was very clear that unless there is an the end use of all this remote sensing data, it is not likely to grow. And to get funding from government of India, you need to make sure that this is something which is useful to that thing. Large number of users or end stakeholders into the umbrella of this one. And in fact, it is to his great credit of visionary that he thought of this concept of national natural resources management system. That means where data from the satellites is one component of the information that is required for managing the natural resources optimally. That is how he said you could have many other pieces of information which come from different components, but one of them can be this, and this is synoptic, and this is you know, it occurs since the, it's an orbital phenomenon, so you get the data more frequently, you can use it, etc. So this is how he got the concept of NNRMs. But the concept had to be got 
accepted by a large number of people. So a lot of user ministries had to be involved in that. So he said in order to demonstrate the use of this one, there were 52 end-to-end -end experiments. That means the end goal is to find water, groundwater. For that, you start with from satellite data, go all the way, geophysical surveys, do some surveys, ground truth, and then go down, down, down. So this is an end to end. You know, that is how the concept. And these were done during this period, 1979, 80, 81, around that time. And these were presented to a set of secretaries. At that time, I remember Professor M.G.K. Menon, Dr. Vardarajan, uh, Dr. Goyal or somebody from Ministry of Agriculture. There were many of those people who were present and they adopted, they adopted the resolution of that national seminar and establishing NNRMS. But one very important thing we should all remember in India. India is a federal state. All resources in India don't belong to the central government. They belong to the states. Forests, agriculture, water, of course, is an interstate uh, disputed uh, thing, but resources, mining. Recently, you have heard of a lot of discussion on mining, whether the state has a royalty to be paid, etc. So all resources belong to the states. So we are dealing with natural resources. Our whole technology is for the information on the natural resources. So Professor Dhawan, again, along with his uh, very able deputy, whom you, some of you may be knowing, Mr. Vyas Rajan, they together felt that unless we involve the states into this one, this will not succeed. That is how, and if you want to involve states, then the state people need to be aware. They need to be knowledgeable in these things. That is how the state remote sensing application centers, et cetera, was done. And we also started looking at building our own uh, satellite. Okay, that is how the natural, natural resources management system, that is how you see here, and whether the actual work gets done or not, we had the standing committees chaired by the secretary of the respective user ministries, we had the DOS centers, we had the state natural resources management system, we had the state remote sensing sector, plus, of course, a large number of NGOs, because most of the work at the end is done by the NGOs, whether it is watershed development or joint forestry management. Many of those things are done by NGOs, non-government organizations. So they were also involved in this. So all this is the academic research institutes, all these were involved in this particular uh, thing, okay? Now, I, when somebody said that uh, I was involved, yes, I was involved in almost everything, joint experiments program, end-to-end -end experiments, uh, NNRMS discussions, almost anything that I have said so far, I was involved, I was doing, but at the same time, I was also doing some basic research, basic experiments. And uh, this is this I call tripod remote sensing, because this was a tripod on which you have a ground truth radiometer, and uh, you are measuring the spectral reflectance of crops, whether it is wheat or rice or any of those things, grown under different agronomic conditions. Now, if it is something which is sown early, something which has been given fertilizers, something which has not been given fertilizers, something which has been given five times irrigation, something which is given only three times, and then you have a randomized block design, all such experiments and measure these things. And on the basis of the spectral responses, then you find out which are the spectral bands which should be put on the sensor which goes on the satellites. Okay, so that is the kind of work which I was engaged. I must tell you one thing, that I also had very thick black hair and it was full, <laughs> okay? So, so I was not like this earlier in those days. 
<laughs> okay. Now, so this is how the IRS 1A uh, was formulated on the basis of these experiments, etc. Since agriculture was predominantly our major application based upon that. And of course, we built a large series of uh, satellites. And I must credit Professor U.R. Rao uh, for this particular thing. IRS 1A was launched on March 17th, 1988 which happens to be my date of birth. Uh, although 40 years old I was, but March 17th. But unfortunately, Professor Rao must have thought that he wanted to launch it on March 10th. That was his birthday. But for the, some reasons, it got postponed. And it got also postponed by one week. I mean, th this I'm just telling you as a lightheartedly. Uh, I have great respect for for Professor Rao, he wouldn't have uh, manipulated to the date uh, in that sense. But anyway, uh, we had uh, IRS 1A, which had four spectral bands, two resolutions, 22 day repetitivity, etc. It was extremely good at the stage at which we were, because that was a very uh, extremely, uh, what shall I say, successful data that we could get. But we, being a, from uh, the final stakeholders, if we were to do crop production forecasting for the entire country, or if we are to look at forest every seventh day, if we have to look at floods occurring, 22 day PTBT is not good enough because if you miss one 22 day, then you get after 44 days. So we said we want more frequent data. We said we want something which has a short wave infrared which is sensitive to soil or uh, to moisture because if there is no moisture enough moisture if it is the moisture stressed then the yield is likely to be less so we had our own ideas from our own ground experiments etc so we said no this uh, irs 1a is not good enough it is okay at that time so we went into definition of newer satellite like resource sat 1 with five-day repeatability, but then we have to compromise on certain resolution and on so on and so forth. India has six months of uh, cloud cover and uh, major crop as far as India is concerned is paddy and paddy is grown only during June to September. We can't do it using the optical data. So we said we require microwave. Oh, we have to keep on arguing, pressurizing, and so on and so forth with the subsequent chairman. Particularly, I recollect that uh, Professor uh, Dr. Kasturangan, we had a lot of arguments uh, with them. And then that is how we got finally RISAT, Radar Imaging Satellite 1, in 2012, about 26 days after retired, in uh, 2012, March, April 26th. So, of course, these are the set of satellites which we went through as far as remote sensing is concerned. Then, of course, we similarly, we had the inside series of satellites to look at clouds, cloud cover, and the cloud top temperatures to make some inferences on monsoon. We also had satellites on, uh, on oceanography, particularly ocean color initially, then later on, scatterometer for wind vectors. We also had in 1999 and 2001, a satellite called TES, Technology Experimental Satellite, because the reason was in 99, we had the Cargill war. And uh, one of the reasons for that was that if there is an early snow melt, most of the excess roads uh, get exposed and the infiltration becomes very high. So you need to have a satellite with very high resolution, which can monitor the snow cover and the snow melt. And that is how these high resolution satellites, which can also be have very frequent revisit, where something we thought and uh, Cartosat series of satellites were, uh, were designed. Then of course we have gone to planetary and space missions as well after these many of these things.
Now, I just want to show you during this period of growth, during this period, the GIS had entered the field. See, earlier we were all people with remote sensing as professionals, and we were very proud of our remote sensing. But the, the GIS made a mark sometime in the mid 80s, and GIS, many people thought the GIS is more important than remote sensing itself. We thought GIS is only a software. So what is this GIS? What is this geomatics? So there was a lot of confusion and so on and so forth during our days there. This is just one small illustration of that. So one of my colleagues called Dr. S.D. Naik, who passed away last year, uh, last year or year before last, due to COVID, he, he was a colleague of ours. He was a good caricaturist. And uh, he, he had just drawn this. I thought I should bring it to your attention to show you that this GIS and this uh, remote sensing so-called rivalry or the di discussions used to be very strong those days. In fact, it has led to the Indian Society of Geomatics being formed also. You know that thing. But then when I was a, a president of ISG as well as ISRS, I had to resolve it and make sure that both of them don't hold their seminars together and uh, approach everybody who is a sponsoring organization and create big problems. So we made it alternate, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you can, uh, some of you who know can uh, make out the gentleman who is sitting in the middle there. Uh, if you don't know, it's all right. But uh, can anybody say who is he? Dr. Baldev Sahai. <laughs> Okay, so this was one, you know, way of uh, expression of those days. We used to have fun, a lot of fun. And image processing, earlier we were all photo interpretation, nothing nothing more than the visual photo interpretation, right, in the 80s, etc. Computers were not there. Now suddenly the computers had come, and some people had become so crazy of using the computers. This one particular gentleman at home, he is, uh, you know, hobnobbing with the TV itself. So his wife is trying to admonish him that, look, this is our TV. Don't think that it is your image processing system. And I keep on playing the entire day. You know, this kind of exciting, uh, yes, exciting time that we used to have. This Dr. S.D. Naik used to bring all this, uh, you know, laugh onto our faces by making these things. Now, you know, when you do image processing, you always have, they based upon the training statistics. You know, if you don't have a proper training statistics, you will have a lot of, what shall I say, commissioner, commission errors and omission errors. So you lose a million pixels, et cetera. So this fellow is with, a, with a, you know, Durbin, he's trying to find where is that, you know, missed pixel, et cetera. In this, part. these were the times during the 80, mid 80s and 90s. This was the one which used to happen. I had a, uh, in fact, a series of such things, but I don't want to get into that alone. That was just a diversion uh, to this one. So, Dr. Kasturangan's period, of course, we a large number of application programs, uh, you know, have happened national level. We made a big uh, impact on all the national level programs in almost all areas. Uh, fisheries became an important thing. Ocean state forecasting, improved weather forecasting. Uh, for the first time, I thought uh, weather forecasting, including cyclones, et cetera, became extremely good. In fact, 1999, when you had the super cyclone of Orissa, 40,000 people died. But subsequent to that, you have seen that our ability to uh, predict both landfall as well as how many hours before the cyclone is likely to hit be, be, has become extremely good, plus or minus 30 kilometers and 12 hours. So that is how uh, we are able to have a cyclone monitoring system extremely well. Floods, we have done extremely well. Then, of course, tsunami came in 2004, December 26. We had a tsunami center, which was set up at uh, Incoys, droughts and floods, etc. 
and a large amount of work also has gone into institutionalization. For example, fisheries and tsunami have gone into inquiries at Hyderabad, Forest Survey of India, for example, the first work which was done by NRSA when we said that only 16% of geographic area of the country is under forest, whereas the Forest Survey of India got very angry. They said, no, no, our forest is about 21%. Then it went up to Mr. T. N. Sheshan, the great uh, bureaucrat. He was the secretary of the Ministry of Environment Forest. So he called both of them, Forest Survey of India people, as well as NRSC people. He said, no, 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 you must have a reconciliation. And that reconciliation exercise itself was a very big thing. And anyway, finally, some of the NRSC scientists had to admit that the dry deciduous forest during the winter, they don't look like forests because no leaves are there. So uh, that is treated as non-forest. Uh, so anyway, that 16% was brought to 19%, which was acceptable to both parties, neither mine nor yours, you know, that kind of a thing. And then most important thing is that the Ministry Forest Survey of India was, uh, was mandated to give every two years a forest survey report uh, to the parliament. And today also you see every two years they give uh, the forest and the status uh, and where the encroachment, etc. That is another great institutionalization that has happened. Then uh, Mahal Nobis National Crop Forecasting Center for Agriculture that has happened. And among all the state remote sensing centers, I must say the BISAC, Bhaskaracharya Institute for Space Applications and Geoinformatics has become extremely powerful. And now they are not any more state center. They are national center. Young by SAC. Uh, so that itself has its own Gati Shakti program, which is there, etc. So a lot of work has been done over the years. We have had international collaboration with uh, US, with ESA, DLR, GEO, and of course, we have moved over to the planetary and space sciences as well. So, I mean, I must say that I have had a role to play in each of these things. Now, this is just to show you that our work, today many people talk about sustainable development goals of the United Nations, right? So SDGs, what you call them. But if we actually see our concept of NNRMS is nothing but sustainable development goals. And this book, which was written by S.K. Das, who is a bureaucrat in the Department of Space belonging to the Karnataka cadre, and he has written, and I have only taken an extract from that book, Kalia and his self-help group team members in Zabwa built check dams helped by the watershed development program. And this was again through remote sensing help of the images, et cetera. Khalil, a fisherman from Lakshadweep, saves time in catching tuna fish using PZ, P, PFZ advisory delivered in a local language. This is again done by uh, satellites, right? And then land reclamation, that is the saline sites are claimed. Then somebody else is gets the, by drilling the bore well, he gets uh, drinking water purposes, etc. There is also through satellite communication, a small child in Tripura gets treated by Dr. Devi Shetty, renowned cardiac surgeon of Bangalore through this one. So actual, our entire vision of national natural resources management system, which was conceptualized in 1983 itself, and the kind of work that we did with our remote sensing and GIS was actually sustainable development goals, which the world was recognizing during the earlier periods. But apparently, apparently, we seem to have what should I say, forgotten our own NLRMS and all those such things nowadays. And we don't know what to do. But actually, it is we who had created this kind of a environment for making an impact in the world at that time. Now, subsequent to that, of course, uh, I'm only telling you that uh, by 2010 or so, we hardly had any remote sensing missions, new missions defined. 
whatever missions we had earlier defined, they were launched and so on and so forth. But further missions were not there. When, um, then uh, there was a small team set up, uh, which I had to chair. And I had uh, two or three uh, workshops, very intensive workshops. One was held in Delhi. One was held in uh, Hyderabad or Bangalore. Uh, in order to find out what kind of systems are required from the stakeholders in order to continue with our remote sensing observations. And uh, we deliberated a great deal and we defined three types of missions. One which are essential, one which are desirable, third experimental or advanced technology missions, uh, both in both in land, ocean, and atmosphere. All these were done, and a big report has been submitted in 2018 itself. But as usual, it may be in some place. Now, what is it that is a changing scenario affecting Indian remote sensing today? I mean, these are, uh, as put it in the bracket, these are my views, OK? First thing is availability and easy accessibility of high quality free data from international missions, which international sources are available to you. So there are no takers for priced Indian data. This is one point. Specific data most desired by the stakeholders of high spatial resolution, multispectral, hyperspectral, and SAR data are not easily available. You don't have a planet lab type of data we don't have. Then there are new space policy initiatives, geospatial data policy, RS data policy by government of India, promoting private participants in all aspects of space components, availability of data free, Bhuvan, Bhunidhi, Gati Shakti, establishment of NSIL in space startups are entirely changing the environment and making wonder what you should be doing. I mean, effectively, that question, whether you ad admit or not, is there. That question is there. Remote sensing and SATCOM missions are envisaged to be demand-driven, not necessarily by public good. Demand-driven means only if Ministry of Agriculture or the farmers come and say, that I need to have a set of satellites for making a forecast one month in advance. Then only, and somebody is ready to pay for that, then only you will build the satellite. Otherwise, you are not supposed to be building the satellites. Same thing is true for satellite communication satellites. This is what I'm told. If I'm wrong, you can correct me. That's why I put it as my view. So these are demand driven. Then emphasis has shifted towards space exploration, like you know, planetary missions, human space flight, Bharat space station, etc. So obviously there is a point, there is a, something called capability and capacity. See, capability is your ability to do certain things. Capacity is your ability to do many things simultaneously. Now, obviously we have the capability but you don't have the capacity to do these things as well as building a large number of remote sensing communication satellites. If you are building, if you are in a mass mission, that time no remote sensing satellite would be built. You know, this is, this is I have seen myself during my time, etc. But the good thing about, very, very, very good thing about the whole thing is, however, Technology has got embedded in the governance systems in the country. In the country, people are using, departments are using, stakeholders are using because of the institutionalization in both public and private systems. And the progress continues. Perhaps emphasis on advanced science systems, climate change measurements are perhaps what we should be doing. Now, in the context of all these things, what is it that the Indian Society of Remote Sensing or a professional society should be doing? Now, in my view, remote sensing, any professional societies and the so-called technology developers, they are always in symbiotic relationship. One helps the other. 
in many ways. How does it happen? Because India, if you see Indian Photo Interpretation Society, IPI, I think it was, uh, IPS, which later on became ISRS, Indian Society of Geomatics, INCA, all these people have helped promote technology over the years. There has been a symbiotic relationship between society and technologies. They have provided a common platform for all professionals to interact on an equal footing, no hierarchy. If you have to go to some institution in organizations, there's a hierarchy. You cannot argue, you cannot debate. He will say, you shut up, you know? You are, no, no, you don't understand it. Whereas in society discussions, there is no such thing. In society, members are all equal. So it gives a platform, common platform, which earlier used to happen. I don't know now whether under the new president it is allowed or not, I don't know. But we, we used to have a lot of fights with the, in the society discussions, etc. So this is a this is one hallmark of a professional society. The other thing I want to tell you is that feedback to technology developers is something which the society can give. Now, in 1996, I remember, Dr. George Joseph was the president of the society, and he made a small study team under me, uh, saying that you tell me what are the mission requirements from various category of water resources, agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. You do some, some studies or whatever simulations, whatever it is, you do it and tell me. And we did. And we did it, and it is published in current science. And that is a, something which was more or less a road roadmap for many of the satellites which came later, like WIPS, et cetera, which we had. They were put in that 1996 uh, uh, group, study group. And one of the persons whom I remember still today is uh, KK Mohanty who was with us, he contributed to that. He also made one questionnaire and sent it to a large number of people to get the stakeholders, etc. The second most important thing is, I remember in Cartosat 1, which was launched in 2005, many a times what happens is our satellite data, many a times outsiders doubt the quality, doubt whether it is calibrated properly or not doubt something or those or something. In, in Cartosat 1, ISRS, through ISPRS, created a working group to study what is the quality of Cartosat 1 stereo data. That is the, you know, nadir and oblique looking uh, two, two system, two stereo system, stereo two pairs system. And Christian Heipke was also involved in this. They came up that this is an excellent piece of data, and you can prepare the stereo data for this. This is a contribution of ISRS, SPRS, to the people who build the satellites, etc. So this is another way in which the society help the developers in many ways. Then in IRS, we also, in fact, celebrated IRS 1A uh, Silver Jubilee in 2013 uh, very, very well. Society is able to spread across the country through various chapters very quickly. So the, the promotion of the technology in the entire country, what society can do, you know, organizations, it is difficult to do because they're not always so much interested in that thing. You have seen those things, right? So that is also very important. Annual symposia at different parts of the country, they have brought more exposure, interaction, among very different people, et cetera. I mean, people whom you did not know. You will only know those who are in IARS or in SAC or in NRC, whereas the whole gamut of all these things has improved only because of the uh, societies, et cetera. International exposure. Now, many of you, I hope many of you, have exposure, international exposure through ISPRS. At least I had ACRS that also many people have, that gives you also a reality check. Where do you stand? You know, you may think you, as if you are the king in your own domain, whereas when you interact with others across the world, then you realize where do you stand? 
So that reality check also happens. For that, the professional societies are extremely important. And our society gets recognized, as was told by uh, Dr. Agarwal. Our scheme, spotting young achievers, etc. Nowadays, anyway, the government has stopped giving awards, uh, except for this Vijnana Shri, which were recently announced. So it is the societies which can do recognition to the young people for awards, etc. So that is the kind of thing which the societies do, etc. Now, one thing which I thought, you know, many of you are aware, you must, I don't know about the youngsters here, but many of us, at least during our time, we always used to refer to manual of remote sensing, volume one, volume two, volume three. Who has, who has done it? It is the ASPRS, American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. And they are the people who made, who commissioned that manual of remote sensing in the 70s, in the 80s. In fact, in the volume three, one, two of my colleagues, Dr. Sushma Panigrahi and uh, K.R. Manjunath, they wrote a chapter on uh, wetland agriculture as well, extremely well written. So that's a contribution which society we can make. Now, why not? Why not Indian Society of Remote Sensing? Yes, Indian Society of Remote Sensing is making efforts through Taylor and Francis or through CRC or whatever it is for individuals to write books, etc. But that is something which is an individual effort. But the society itself can commission a edited volume of book, which consists of the work of the Indian remote sensing program of last, let's say, 60 years or 50 years of though in different areas of that. And that will sell, that will stand the test of time for many years to come. You know, that is something which we can do. But there's one more last point. You know, many of the academic societies have this so-called fellowship program. ISR also has right to 50 maximum, and people, etc. So there is still enthusiasm for them to excel, to, to work more. And we could have a two-day workshop in which these young fellows can make the presentations. Then you know whether he's worth that fellowship which was given to him or not. Now, you don't know that the fellow you have identified a fellow, he gets a, you know one certificate, he goes home, he never even participates, I mean, many of them. So something new which we should be able to do with this fellowship program and organize uh, something of this kind as well. So these are just a few thoughts that I had. So I was very afraid of giving this talk because I felt that, uh, you know, you're all so advanced technologically and in terms of technical work, etc. So whether I can speak on anything which is uh, makes sense to you. So I thought that I will talk to you about uh, sort of genesis and evolution of uh, uh, the technology. Thank you so much for listening. Yes. Yeah, sure, 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 definitely. We can have some quick questions.